Okay, here's a question for you. Is our national habit of eating dead animals dragging us closer and closer to a flu pandemic that could kill tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of Americans? Seriously, I'm not talking about, you know, people getting sick with, uh, you know, uh, too much fat in their diet or cholesterol or something. I'm, I'm talking about eating dead animals leading us to a flu pandemic. Dr. Michael Greger believes so. Up to 60 million Americans get the flu every year. What if it turned dead? We know that the flu is already deadly. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of Americans die every year from the regular seasonal flu, which, by the way, according to the Centers for Disease Control, has a mortality rate of about two tenths of one percent point two percent a particularly severe and infectious form of the flu struck the world back in 1918 infecting a third of the global population killed as many as a hundred million people in the united states we lost about a half million americans that was not like the regular seasonal flu with that flu instead of a mortality rate of 0.2 percent the 1918 strand of influenza had a mortality rate of 2.5 percent and that was the worst plague in history in terms of numbers of people who had died from a disease arguably as the percentage of the population the black plague outnumbered it but still 2.5 percent mortality killed hundreds of millions of people but what if a strand of influenza swept across the nation that was 25 times deadlier than the 1918 strand what if we were dealing with a flu pandemic that had a 60% mortality rate? Six out of 10 people, three out of five people who get it die. Well, here's the frightening news. We already are dealing with a flu like that. An extremely deadly and contagious form of bird flu, H5N1, has already infected people in several countries, including densely populated China and Indonesia, as well as Thailand, Vietnam, and Egypt, among others. Just in 2012, known cases of this H5N1 bird flu in Cambodia killed 90% of the people infected with it. In China, 65% died. In Indonesia, the mortality rate was 83%. And in Laos and Nigeria, the mortality rate was 100%. Every single person who got it died. If the 60 million Americans who get the flu every year suddenly got this particular strand of the flu, H5N1, then upwards of 40 million Americans would die. It would be a disaster on a scale never before seen in this country or any other, other than possibly how Europeans wiped out Native Americans when they first brought the original flu from Europe over to the North American continent. And if it spread around the rest of the world, it would make the Black Plague of the 14th century look like the common cold. Here's what Dr. Greger said about this particular flu. It's like crossing one of the deadliest known human diseases, Ebola, with one of the you know, most contagious known diseases, influenza. Most likely to cause this flu to go viral, as it were. I mean, right now... You can't get the flu, you can't get this particular kind of flu unless you come into direct contact with an infected bird and get its body fluids inside your body. Right? It's almost like AIDS transmission. But this particular type of flu, if it were to go airborne, we're screwed. And what did Dr. Greger say could cause that? Factory farming. He said we should be doing everything we can possibly do to defend ourselves against this apocalyptic pandemic. Yet every day we as a nation continue factory farming and every day we're tempting fate. Because the only thing stopping the H5N1 influenza from killing billions of people around the planet is the H5N1 flu itself. Only about 600 people have been infected so far by this flu simply because it hasn't yet mutated to a form that can more easily infect humans. Right now, it's good at infecting uh, the, the particular viral receptors that coat the trachea or the windpipe of birds. It needs to mutate to better attach to human receptors, but there's evidence that a strain in Indonesia and a strain in Egypt are, are acquiring slowly those mutations. In fact, in Indonesia last year, it was 100% mortality. Every person that got the H5N1 bird flu died. So jamming birds together in factory farm slaughterhouses and pumping them up with antibiotics 
promotes these mutations. Now that local small family farm and local supermarket butchers have been replaced by giant trans, transnational corporation slaughterhouses, we've seen a radical and rapid increase in mutant strains of the flu, along with other diseases that come from factory farms like the newly mutated and now deadly forms of E. coli and salmonella. We've domesticated birds for thousands of years. It's really just been in the last few years where we've seen this unprecedented emergence of these highly pathogenic strains which have killed hundreds of millions of birds. And it's thought that is the, you know, when we cram tens of thousands of animals in these cramped, filthy football field shies sheds to lie beak to beak or snout to snout atop their own waist, it's kind of a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of these so-called super strains of influenza. Now, in addition, there are other consequences of factory farming that we know about. Our national diet has more meat in it than ever before, which is accelerating our rates of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and other illnesses that are responsible for increasing health care costs. And factory farms require enormous amounts of food and water. According to a report by the World Bank's uh, Group International Finance Corporation, 51% of all greenhouse gas emissions are the direct or indirect result of giant factory farms raising cattle, pigs, and poultry. That's pretty mind-boggling. In other words, factory farming is hurtling our planet toward catastrophic climate change. But so far, these reasons haven't been strong enough to really motivate us to change. Americans and policymakers haven't been ready to move away from the factory farm model to bring back local farming and reform our diet by eating fewer dead animals. But if nothing else... The fear of a worldwide pandemic that kills more than half the human race should motivate us to change how we farm and how we eat. Let's hope. Because whatever joy we as a nation get out of eating chicken wings will be far outweighed by the catastrophe of watching millions of our fellow humans die. Talk about revenge of the birds. To save the human race, we need to end factory farming now. Now, we know that factory farming of cows and pigs has led to these, the, the H, uh, uh, I think it's the H157 variety of E. coli. E. coli is a normal intestinal bacteria that everybody has, but this particular variation causes kidney failure and kills people, kills Americans every year. Listeria is, a, is a, another microbe that can live in your gut that has been around for you know, centuries, and only recently has mutated into a form that's like really, really snotty deadly, terribly deadly, and, is, and kills people, kills Americans. And both of them were pretty sure mutated on factory farms. In fact, the original flu epidemic of 1918 started on a factory farm in Kansas. And soldiers who were in Kansas preparing, you know, going through basic training and preparing to, to muster out to World War I carried that flu into Europe where it became known as the Spanish flu because they spread it to large populations in the middle of the war. And then they brought it back home and, and boom, we had this flu epidemic and millions of people died. So when are we going to start talking about the damage that factory farms do, not just to our environment, not just to our food supply? This is the Tom Hartman Program. So... Would you become a vegan if it meant saving humanity? <laughs>